All right, so last time I recorded the entire, for those of you, if anybody's watching the live stream because they're not in class today, I recorded the entire live stream without audio because somebody had gone through and checked the speaker. So if you want to go check that now, I'm going to make sure that we are actually getting a audio. So we're going to do an audio check real quick before we start with today's discussion of ethics. I am, I've gotten lazy. I used to walk around and hand out ducks when you would answer questions for class participation points. And I've decided that I'll just put some ducks on everybody's table. Yeah. It's working? Yeah. Okay, fantastic, that's great. So uh, if I tell you you can grab a duck, you can grab a duck, that way I can keep track of class participation points and I won't have to walk up and down the aisle. We'll see how that works. You know, we'll see if somebody starts trying to cheat and steal ducks. I. Uh, bought my niece and nephew a game of Monopoly called Cheater's Edition. Have any of you seen this? And the whole purpose is to try and cheat. And I like win every single time because I guess I'm the best cheater, which says something. You know, I didn't go to law school to obey the rules, which maybe says something about ethics and you know, whether or not I practice it. I know a lot about it. doesn't mean I necessarily practice it perfectly. So we were talking last time, and just because it was not captured on the audio. I'm gonna do a real quick recap so that it's there. So if you are studying for the exams and things like that, you will have some audio of what we talked about last time. So what we were talking about last time is why should we study philosophical ethics in marketing? What do a handful of thinkers in the ancient world possibly have to offer modern people who have the ability to broadcast live. You know, when I was a kid growing up, you know, it was a handful of people that could reach an audience of millions. And now with YouTube, you can reach an audience of millions. You can become a social influencer. What could people in the ancient world possibly know about any of these things like airplanes and cars and YouTube and the internet that would possibly be relevant today? Well, it turns out that there were a lot and it's because of these Three questions, the question of knowledge, the question of conduct, and the question of governance. What is it we can know, and how can we know it? And we discussed this, and with regard to this, this thing in front of us, what is this? You all said it was a table. I said, I think it's a desk, because you're using it as a desk. So does it change forms from a table to a desk based on use? Or is this all just some social construct that we make up? We think we know what we're saying and we think other people understand us. And it turns out that in many instances, what we think we know and what we think we're communicating are two different things. And I gave you an example of this in terms of an instrument that I used uh, for my dissertation, which has what's called a double barrel question. And it, so we think we're measuring these ideas of ethics, and because this question is double-barreled, it may be problematic. The question asks whether or not rigidly codifying a code of ethics could have a bad impact on human development and uh, um, adjustment, human adjustment and socialization or something like that. And I said, they're not the same thing. Whether or not you're a well-adjusted person is something completely different from whether or not you get along well with people, right? Human relations, that was the question. Whether or not it can lead to, to bad results in human uh, adjustment and relations. Adjustment and relations are two different things. You can have good relations with people and not be psychologically well adjusted. There are lots of people who I suggested were you know, sociopaths. And I did go back actually and look and make sure that I was correct in telling you that sociopath and psychopathology are not defined in the DSM-5. They're not, uh, although clinicians find them useful and a useful distinction. They're simply lumped together as one category, which is antisocial, antisocial personality disorder in the DSM-5. Now, that, that's a range, right, of, of different things. And there are differences, according to people who actually practice in this field, between sociopaths and psychopaths. Sociopaths generally, in sort of a, a rough way of breaking it down, are willing to manipulate people to get what they want. And they may have great relations, at least initially, with lots of people, because they're generally gregarious and outgoing. 
And there was a book that was written called The Sociopath Next Door, but they're not, they're not well adjusted. They may be able to make good relationships and have good relationships with people, but because they're manipulative, they're not well adjusted. And so we, we really have to think about what it is we can know and how can we know it. And can we know anything in ethics like the proofs that we have in mathematics? So for example, I gave you a formula last time. This time we'll do triangle. If I have a rectilinear triangle, that's a right angle triangle. And I have one side that's three and the other side that's four. What does the third side have to be? Uh, what's the third side? A squared plus B squared plus C squared. So, what is it? It's five. Five, right? Um, can we know anything like this? This is true. How did Pythagoras come up with this? Did he go around drawing uh, rectilinear triangles in the dirt? No, he didn't do that. You can see this with the mind's eye. You can know this a priori. It's true at all places at all times. It's true on the surface of the moon as it is in this classroom, right? Is there anything that we can know in ethics like this? And we'll, we'll talk about, about this. What, what can we know? The question of conduct. So we'll deal a little bit with the question of knowledge. This in philosophy is divided into two fields. One is called epistemology, and that's the study of how we, we come to know things. It comes from episteme, which is the Greek word for knowledge. And the second subfield of ethics, or the second subfield of philosophy with regard to this is called metaphysics. What is reality? How can we know what is really out there? What is going on? How do we know that, for example, I'm not you, you're not me, we're the wall, and this is all a grand illusion? That's Buddhist philosophy, right? I'm you, you're me. We're the wall, and this is all a grand illusion. Nothing exists. It's understanding the state of nothingness. I'm, I'm reducing you know, Eastern philosophy down to the point where philosophers would be horrified. But you know, how do we know that what's going on around us is really going on? So epistemology and uh, metaphysics. The question of conduct, how should we behave? What are our duties? Do we owe duties? to the planet. Do we owe duties to each other? Uh, Kant says we only owe duties to rational beings. Why is that? What is it that, that is the right course of conduct? And then, of course, the question of governance. How should we govern ourselves? And this is not just in terms of governments of the United States, but also, for example, in the business context, how should we govern our corporations? What should we do? How, what duties do we owe, for example, to shareholders, to stakeholders in terms of corporate social responsibility? So these are the three questions that we will struggle with this semester. And then we're going to apply marketing theory to these questions and attempt to solve problems from a philosophical nature in the marketing context. Now, philosophy answers these three questions. It's not the only way we can answer these questions. We can answer these questions in other ways. But when we answer these questions in other ways, it becomes problematic. So how else can we answer these questions? Well, you can answer these questions using a mythology. What is a mythology? What is mythology? Anybody know? Is it the study of myths? The study of what? Myths. The study of myths. What are myths? Okay, you can have a duck. Take a duck. What what are what are myths? Legends, stories. Legends, stories. Okay, you can have a duck. Yeah, mythology is generally what we consider non-valid religions. Right? They're, they're dead religions, right? So you can, you can 
answer these questions with a mythology. The ancient Hebrews answered this question, right? So you can answer this question with religion, which we would consider valid, uh, valid religion. So mythology are, are religions that we've discarded. The, the, the animistic religions, things like that. We can answer these questions with a, with a modern religion. So, uh, you know, the Bible has a story about the origins of, of the universe. Myths have these same stories, right? Now, the, the problem with answering these questions using a mythology or a religion is that you get interesting results. So, for example, whose mythology or whose religion are we going to use to understand these questions of knowledge? What it is we can know and how we can know it? Well, I guess in the United States, we would use the Bible. What's, what's wrong with that? Well, how old is, is the world according to the Bible? like 5,000 years old, right? R roughly 5,000 years old. The, the world's not 5,000 years old, right? I mean, um, these are allegories. Whose interpretation are we gonna use of that book? The Bibles are, are not the same, right? The foundation of the Christian Bible is what Jews call the Torah or what Christians call the Old Testament. But depending on which version of the Bible, there are various numbers of books, right? The Catholic Bible differs from the King James Version of the Bible, which is generally the foundation of the Protestant Bible. There are differences in, in interpretations. The Jews have an entire book dedicated to the interpretation of these ancient texts called the Talmud, which is rabbinic scholarship on these things. So whose interpretation are we going to use? You can see this, this is going to be problematic, right, to rely on something like a mythology or a religion to answer these questions, particularly when we live in a globally connect connected world where there are nations that we deal with, that we trade with, that don't engage in anything that resembles the Judeo-Christian tradition. Japan, China, most of the rest of the world. So we're gonna have problems if we rely on these sources to answer these three great questions. Which leads me to the question of, is philosophy, what is philosophy, and why did the Greeks, or did the Greeks invent it? And if they did invent it, why did they invent it? Well, philosophy answers these questions not by turning to the book, or not by seeking the wise man who reads the book. Prior to the Reformation, the faith of the Holy See said that the average person shouldn't read the Bible because they'll get it wrong. And I'm convinced we usually do get it wrong, right? I mean, you have to think when you read the Bible. So the Catholic Church provided this person who would interpret the Bible for you. That's why the Mass was said in Latin, so that the average person couldn't, and you had to go to the priest to understand it, to decode the meaning of the Bible. Well, the ancient Greeks started thinking about these questions. And the reason I think they started thinking about these questions is because they didn't have a satisfactory mythology that answered these questions. That's why I think they invented philosophy because their mythology didn't satisfactorily answer 
the ultimate questions of life. What it is, what it, what is it I can know? How can I know it? How should I behave with regard to other people? And what, what system of government is the best? Why do I say they didn't have a satisfactory mythology or religion? Well, for the ancient Greeks, there were these gods, right? There was uh, the king of the gods, Zeus. And how did Zeus, anybody know how Zeus became king of the gods? There were gods before there were gods on Mount Olympus. There were the Titans. And because the myth was that one of the children of the Titans would kill their father every time their mother gave birth to a child, Kronos would eat the child. But Zeus managed to escape by a trick that his mother played on his father. And when she gave birth, she gave the father a stone and he ate it instead. And these younger gods, in essence, take over the older gods. Now, if a god can kill another god, that's not a terribly satisfying, I mean, the, the gods were not, not people who you turn to for ultimate advice. They're messy. They're coming down from Mount Olympus and they're having children with humans. Zeus has uh, a number of children with mortals and these become demigods. And you can see, this is, these are not people that you turn to for the ultimate answers. You may not want to upset them. You may offer sacrifices to them, but they're not, they're not people who you are turning to for the ultimate. The, the Greeks didn't have, I think the reason maybe the ancient Greeks invented philosophy was because they didn't have a satisfactory answer in their mythology to these questions. And so, we get the foundations of philosophy emerging in Athens, you know, 2,500 years ago. And it starts with a thinker named Socrates. Now, there may have been, before the Socratics, there may have been philosophy in the ancient world. We have echoes of this before among ancient people in the Upanishads and in Eastern religions. We have these, these echoes of the origins of philosophy, but we really get the first fully worked out system of philosophy that answers these questions, the question of knowledge, the question of conduct, the question of governance, beginning with Socrates. Now, how do we know about Socrates? Did he write anything down? You're shaking your head, no. Yeah, that's correct, you get a duck. He didn't write anything down. He uh, went around Athens, he was a gadfly, and he, he asked hard questions. A question that you'll answer as a group in the first critical thinking challenge, which is, I think, due in week six, called What is Justice? And what does it have to do with marketing? What you know, and, um, I've had students in this class tell me that justice has nothing to do with marketing, and I'm crazy. That's the that's going to be the wrong answer, by the way. And I had a student that was so adamant about that response that they wrote it in my student evaluations. The teacher knows nothing. He insists that justice has something to do with marketing, and it doesn't. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Um, I guess he thought that my department chair would read that and you know fire me. I'm a tenured professor. It's really hard to get rid of tenured professors. I, when I was associate general counsel, we had a professor who stabbed a student with a pencil and I tried to fire him and I couldn't get him fired. You know, So, I mean, it's really tough um, to, to do. Uh, and, and that's just the wrong answer. There's The justice has a lot to do with marketing. If we think about justice in, in the greatest sense, 
And this is what Socrates did. He went around Athens asking people, like, you know, I mean, what is what is justice? That's the foundational question of Republic. So we get this question in Republic. And when we talk about when we talk about Socrates and Plato, so the way we know about Socrates is from two sources. His most famous student, who says that he wrote everything that Socrates said down into these books, into the psych, into the uh, um, into the dialogues, and their various books that they're organized into. That's Plato. We also know about him from a, a poet, his friend, um, I believe his name is Xenophon. So we have two sources for Socrates, the poet and, and his student. And Plato says, these are none of these are my ideas. They're all Socrates. I, I'm just the reporter. And I don't think we should take Plato at his word there that he just wrote this down. I mean, that this this is not like the modern, again, this is not like the modern world where one of the things that I realized when I was in law school, I had a laptop computer and I, I went to law school and I took my laptop with me and I decided I'd use it to take notes. And one of the things that I found out was that I wasn't really paying attention in class because I could type, I can type 120 words a minute accurately. I could type as fast as most people were talking. You can talk really, really fast, and I can't type that fast. But most classroom discussions, particularly with professors in law school, are based on the Socratic method, which is Socrates going around and asking these questions. So the professor asks questions, and then the students reply to the questions. And I can type that pretty, pretty quickly. And I wasn't really thinking about it, and I noticed that. I wasn't really thinking about what was being said. I was just typing along and you know, having a happy party in my head somewhere else which is why I started going back to taking notes. And turns out years later that my intuition about this turns out to be correct, that there are studies now that suggest that you need to learn to take notes in class because you can't tie, you can't write down everything I say as quickly as I say it. So you're having to come up with a shorthand of what's really important in class. Like I generally say things two or three times if it's really, really important. Like these questions are really important, so I highlight them. So you probably need to take that down. And you remember things better if you do it in your own handwriting. Um, whereas you can just sit there and type away and not, not think very much about what it is that I'm saying. And you don't have to go back. When I was a, an undergraduate student, I would write my notes out in class, and then I would go back and I would sort of edit them so that I could read because my handwriting was really, really poor. So I would edit. Um, it's one of the things that's a horror to me that they don't teach cursive in school anymore. And most of you probably like learned how to sign your name and that's about it in cursive. Is that correct? You didn't learn cursive? You learned cursive for how long? Well, I'm a lot older. Okay. Well, we, we <laughs> learned, I think we learned cursive, you know, from like second grade. Through, I mean, like we had it for like second through fifth, I think. I mean, like, there, you know, practicing penmanship was a big thing when I was, and now it's like they spend half a semester. My nephew's, you know, uh, about to turn 13, and he's, you know, I was asking him, are you learning cursive? And they're like, yeah, they learned it a little bit. Uh, we had these tablets, these big chief tablets that had the lines with two solid and a dotted line, and practiced writing cursive most they don't do that anymore because it's not on the standardized test but it turns out that this is really pretty good and the reason that cursive is um, better than block print is you can do it a lot faster because you're not picking up the pen so you can you can do the shorthand so you should learn how to write cursive and uh, go back and then I edit my notes and then I'd never look at them again so I would would listen in class I would take notes and then I would go back and I'd sort of edit my notes so that I could read them. And then I never really looked at them again. I graduated with four point. I was class marshal and um, I was the undergraduate outstanding student of the year in the College of Liberal Arts the year I graduated. Uh, and I never read a book. I was horribly afraid of reading. I shouldn't tell you this. 
because that encourages you not to read. But what I was was pretty intellectually curious. And I could like go to class, show up, listen, and regurgitate everything the professor said on, on an exam, which is sort of useful. I wasn't until I got into my master's program that I really had to read because we would have like 12 books, you know, in a semester in a class and you can't possibly, you know, know everything. So you'd actually have to read. And then in law school, you really have to read. So it was in law school and undergrad and in graduate school that I learned to read. Um, but as an undergrad, I had a horrible fear of reading. It made me sleepy. You have to get over that for grad school. So I don't think that we should take Plato at his word that, that he wrote all this stuff down because you, you just possibly couldn't write stuff down that quickly. So a lot of it has to be Plato as well. But I guess the foundational ideas are Socrates. So we start out in Republic. They go to, I believe it's a party, and the host of the party is one of the characters. And he sort of goes off fairly quickly. And, you know, but he says something like, hey, Socrates, how are you? What's going on? And Socrates says, oh, you know, well, I'm, I'm okay. And um, just, you know, thinking about things like uh, what is justice? And um, then he starts this dialogue. And it turns out that this question is really difficult to answer. And some of the, the answers that we get to this question are jettisoned rather quickly. And some are even ideas that Socrates fully works out in early dialogues are refined or discarded in later dialogues. So we can, we can sort of classify the dialogues as early, middle, and late. And as I said, some of the ideas that are really, really worked out in the, in the early dialogues of, of what is justice are, are discarded later on or are refined. And, you know, this, this question of the, the rectilinear triangle comes up in one of the dialogues. So at the party, they're, you know, what is justice? They throw this question out. And um, Republic is the first work that we know of that deals with a, a holistic approach and answers all of these questions. Other echoes of philosophy before that answer one of the questions or two of the questions, but this is the first fully worked out system of philosophy that we know of. And again, that doesn't mean that it didn't exist before, it's just that maybe it's lost to history, whether or not you know somebody else did this. So what is justice? Well, one of the interlocutors says, and this one's very easy for Socrates to discard, justice is the will of the stronger. Now, this answers all three of these questions, but in a very superficial way. What is it I can know? Well, if I'm stronger, I tell you what it is you need to know, right? With regard to conduct, I'm the king, I make the rules, so I'll tell you what conduct is good. And with regard to governance, well, I'm the stronger, so I'm going to be the, the person who governs. Now, what's this doesn't seem attractive to us, does it? Intuitively, it doesn't seem attractive. But if we look around in the world, it's the way things seem to actually work. You're sitting here at, you know, it's now almost 10 o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday here at the Harvard of the Hills, the Berkeley of the Blackjacks, the Princeton of the Plains, the Stanford of the Sticks, the Oxford of the Oaks, otherwise known as the University of Central Oklahoma. And why are you here when you would rather, you know, one of the things I think that led to my success as a student is the fact that basically when I went to college, computers were not in their infancy. We had computers for a long time, but the widespread use of computers, I was one of the first kids to have a laptop computer in undergraduate school. Most people had, when I went to undergraduate school, most people had a desktop and they were expensive. My mother had, a, she was the first real estate office in Santa Fe, New Mexico to have a computer. It was an IBM 
and it was in in 1970 something it was over a thousand dollars for this this device and it sat on this this table in her office and the thing that was great about it was you could put you could make create forms that realtors used and then you just had to fill in the forms you didn't have to go through and type them out they used to actually do this there were these things called typewriters which you've never seen before i actually learned how to type on a typewriter in high school that's what you took in and now they call it keyboarding i guess in in high school you learned to keyboard but there were actually these these things and people put these forms, they came in like triplicate or quadruplicate or how, however many forms you had to have. And they actually had this piece of paper in between them called a carbon paper, which had ink on it. And when you typed on it, it would go through to the other paper on, you know, and, and you'd pull these forms apart and, um, you know, give them to your clients. When you signed a contract, you'd give one copy to the, the seller, one copy to the buyer, the realtor would keep a copy and they'd send a copy to the title company, right? If you if you sign the contract, that's the way it worked. She had this computer, cost over a thousand dollars. It was an IBM. It actually ran on these things called floppies. And of course there are still like remnants of these around. If you look at the save icon on your computer, it is like a depiction of a floppy, the smaller floppies, the ones that this computer took were the big floppies. They were a big square thing and they were actually floppy and they were delicate. You could, they could become demagnetized, you put them in the sleeve. And so it, it was, it was you know, a lot of work um, to keep these things going. You had lots of data failure and there was lots of tears when that would happen when you when you ruin a disc. So you usually make a backup disc copy and so I, you know, I went to undergraduate and I was one of the first people that had this laptop. It weighed about 10 pounds, I think. Uh, the battery life was good for like 30 minutes if you, if you unplugged it. So it was heavy. It had a green, a black and green screen, nothing like what you're carrying around today, which what is your, your, you know, iPad air book way less than a pound probably I would guess. I don't know, somewhere around there. So, you know, these 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 inventions that uh, that allowed us to really um, progress very quickly in terms of what it is we can know and knowledge and the amount of knowledge that that we have is doubling uh, very quickly. Um, is you know it, it's just as astronomical. So going back to Socrates and this idea that, you know, Plato is writing this down, um, the will of the stronger, what is it that you're going to do in this classroom? Again, this is not a, a terribly attractive idea, but it does seem to be the way it works. Why are you here on a Tuesday morning listening to me drone on about this stuff when you have these devices that are unlike the device that I used to have? which was not terribly fun. It was really just for work. And now you've got this device in front of you. And not only can you do what I did, which was take notes on it, use it to create papers for class, but you can play video games. You've got Angry Birds. Uh, you can play, I don't know, what are the popular video games that you've got now? God of War. Anybody play that? Anybody play God of War? My nephew loves God of War. Um, Call of Duty. None of you are gamers. Nobody wants to admit that they're a gamer. Is that it? You don't want to admit that you, that you play these games? What are the popular games? I don't know. I don't, I'm not a gamer. What? Halo. Halo. Or, yeah, Warzone, something like that. Okay. All right. I, uh, Fortnite became popular, and I guess that's now very passe, according to my, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, like that was very popular, and I was like, I played it once, and then I was like, "Hey, Carson, you want to? You wanted me to play it? This was like three years ago or something." And I like, you know, came back two months later and was like, "Do you want to play Fortnite?" And he's like, the look of disgust, like you're completely out of it. You know, that that's gone. We've moved on. Um, and I asked, so you know, I was playing God of War last time, and then I came back and said, "Are you playing?" God of War, and again, I get this look of what planet did you just beam down from? Like that's that's 
so over it. Uh, I was fascinated by God of War because um, the voices, it's very realistic, but if you listen to uh, the voices, um, they hadn't named the kid character in it at the time that they did the, the voicing for it. His name is Andreas, but they hadn't named him. So the voice of the father, who's the God of War, um, calls him boy, but half the time it sounds like Roy. So, you know, I was like, are you, what's Roy doing these days? And um, anyway, so there, you know, he's looking at me like I'm just absolutely crazy and he's on to something else. I don't know what it is. But you can play these games on these devices. And why are you here listening to me? Well, again, going back to this idea of this is the way it seems to work, you're, you're doing it because I have power. And why do I have power? Well, you've chosen to give me a certain amount of power because this class is required if you want to get a degree in marketing. And so you're going to do the things that I tell you to do and show up to class and participate because might makes right in reality. I have the ability to fail you. And that could be devastating to your future plans if I do that. So that's why you're here. Now, because we have these devices that are far more sophisticated than the device that I had, you can do things like, you know, check your email, surf the web, look at things that are more interesting than what it is that I'm talking about, you know, until I start walking around and then you hit the button that, you know, brings up the screen that looks like you're actually working. You can do this at work when your employers are, you know, like you, you get online and you surf. Of course, employers now track, they can track everything that you're doing, what you're surfing and how long you spend on these things. And so this seems to be the way the world works. This answer that, well, it's the will of the stronger, not intellectually satisfying, but that does seem to be the way things work. If I have the power, I'm going to tell you what it is you need to know. Whether it's right or wrong, ultimately in this class, I decide what knowledge is. Now, hopefully, it's correct. Hopefully, what I'm telling you is, is you know, accurate. Although there are inaccuracies in everything. When you, you go through textbooks, I, I told you that if you go through ethics textbooks, one of the things that they'll say is the law is an acceptable moral minimum. And last time we talked about this, the law may not be an acceptable moral minimum. We had a series of laws in this country, beginning with the founding of the nation until the Civil War, that said that one category of people was inherently inferior and they were not citizens and they were property or chattels of the stronger uh, ethnic group. And then after the Civil War, we get the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, and that's supposed to solve this problem, and it doesn't. Because we have this Supreme Court case called Plessy versus Ferguson, in which the Supreme Court said, yeah, you know, we have this Equal Protection Clause, but as long as you have separate but equal, that's good enough. And so we see this in practice. What is Socrates' answer to this thing that we see in practice. Well, that's not the business of the philosopher to tell you what's going on. That may be the way the world works. If you don't answer the way I think you should answer on the exam, it is wrong. Although I've had students debate with me. I don't think I've ever had one win, you know, but, you know, I mean, you know, we can debate. That's, that's the way the world really works. That's not going to be it for a philosophy, because ultimately what it is, 
that we want the question of knowledge, conduct, and governance is we want what is the absolute definition of these ideas of justice. And the way the world works is not maybe the best that it can be. So the job of the philosopher, according to Socrates, is not to tell us what's going on. The fact that you're going to take, I don't know, is it three exams in here or four? I can't remember. It's on the syllabus, right? That's our little contract. There's a, a number of exams. You're going to do this paper with your group on what is justice in here. I'm going to grade it, you know, and you're going to get a grade. And that's, that's the practical application. We want to know what the essence of this is. Not, not what's happening, because what's happening may be completely wrong. So what's another idea about what is justice? Anybody have another idea? If it's not the will of the stronger, which clearly is the way things are actually working, you know, um, one of your colleagues just got up and, and left. There are lots of professors who have these rules, lots of, lots of, lots of, I don't have lots of rules. Come and go, whatever you want, I don't care. Um, Okay, protection of the weak. All right. Okay. Right. All right. So we have this idea: you get a duck, um, or that's an owl. I guess some. It's not all of my ducks are ducks. I call this the duck hunt. Not all of them are ducks. I've. I've I got these ducks um, when my mother was going through chemo. We would, after she would go through chemo, we'd go to Penn Square Mall and walk around the mall. And uh, they have this duck hunting machine. And you put in a dollar and you're guaranteed to get a duck. It's great. It's one of those claw machines that goes down. So I got all these ducks there. And then I thought, what am I going to do with all these ducks? So I brought them to class and started using that as a way of keeping track of who actually participates in class every day. So I... Uh, I don't, I don't forget. It's an easy way of, of keeping track. So I've got these ducks. So protection of the weak. Um, enforcing the right. That's a really attractive idea. And if we look at the world's oldest living uh, legal code that we know about, the first fully formed legal code, it's uh, the Code of Hammurabi. And the primary directive of that code is that the duty, the first duty of government is to protect the powerless from the powerful. That's what that code says. So that's an attractive idea. This idea of protecting the first duty of government is to protect the powerless from the powerful. Okay, well, that's an attractive idea. Why may that not be the ultimate sense? Well, because those roles can reverse and what we want is we want not just something for the powerless but also justice for the powerful anybody have another idea of what is justice Okay. Seeking the truth. All right. I think that's an important part of it. And of course, Socrates would agree because this goes to this question of knowledge of what is ultimately justice. What is the ultimate truth of this? You get a duck. So one of the ideas that's put forth by one of the interlocutors, it's not uh, Thrasymachus, I think he's the one who comes up with, it's the will of the stronger. Um, one of them actually comes up with a, an idea, that, that idea, the will of the stronger idea is very easy for Socrates to dispense with, and that's done away with very, very quickly. Somebody ultimately comes up with this idea of it is giving everybody their due. This is what we call the desserts theory of justice, giving everybody their due. This one's hard to deal with. This one's hard to dispense with. Giving people 
what they are owed. Now, this seems really, really attractive, and it's really hard for Socrates to, to, to do away with this idea. So, what is just in this classroom if I'm giving everybody what they're owed? One of the things, now, students often say to professors things like, I'm the customer. And to some extent, I agree with that as a marketer, because I'm a marketer. Now, my colleagues over in the land of hippy dippy across the, the way there are horrified that I would even entertain this idea. The idea that students are a customer. Because what they say is that students are not the customer of education. Yes, you're paying for it, and you're paying an ever-increasing share of the cost of this. When I went to college, the state of Oklahoma paid 80% of the bill for me to go. I had, I graduated undergraduate with no debt. I was exceedingly fortunate that I had a family that could write the check. I mean, I filled out FAFSA and I did all of that. I didn't get very much. I got some merit-based because I was a decent student in high school and I scored pretty high on the ACT. And so I got some merit scholarships and things like that. But my, my family basically wrote the check and it was pretty cheap at the time. Right? I think like my bill when I was an undergraduate was less than $1,500 for tuition and fee. We didn't have all these stupid fees that they have now. I mean, we had a couple of fees. We had like a library fee. Um, we didn't even have a parking fee here at UCO when I was an undergrad. I started out at OU and I hated OU. And so I came to UCO and I ultimately graduated. And that was a, that was a decision I never regretted because I came here and, you know, I was... I wasn't one of 350 in a classroom. I actually had real professors and um, that was sort of attractive to me and I could live at home. And so, you know, I mean, we didn't have, we didn't have a stupid parking fee. Why did we get the parking fee? Well, they decided to pave all the parking lots. When I came to UCO, we were parking, there was like very few paved parking lots and we were parking mostly on gravel or dirt, which like this parking lot out here was actually paved but all of the parking lot that was east of liberal arts and north, that was all just dirt. You just parked on the gravel lot, which meant that, you know, in the winter it was snowy and icy and they couldn't really blade it off. It was just kind of a mess. So they paved all the parking lots and that's when we had to get the, the fee to pay for it because they had to float a bond issue in order to pay for the parking lot. So now you pay a parking fee. And I'm always surprised at students who complain about the parking here because when I was at OU, they actually had a parking fee there and you couldn't park anywhere near. Students are like, I can't park anywhere near the building. Like, you didn't park anywhere near the building at OU. In fact, you were assigned a lot and you walked forever. So, you know, we paid the parking lots. There's this fee for that. There's a college of business fee. You know, I mean, there's, there's all these fees that they've, they've added on. But there were very few. Like there was a library fee, there was a, um, you paid a one-time fee to get your student ID, you know, and very few. It was basically tuition, library, I think there may have been a student services fee, you know, paid for things like transcripts and, and stuff like that. So very, very little. I, I paid for most of it with cash and I, and I had no debt. So I did well and I got grades. And this goes back to giving everybody their due. So what is it that you're due in here? You say, well, I paid for this and I should earn the grade that I want. No, that's not going to work, right? So what is your due? Well, it's giving you the grade that you earn. And that seems just, doesn't it? So you come to class, you take notes, you do well on the critical thinking challenges, you answer the questions on the exams, and you, you do well on that and you get an A. 
I should give you an A. Right? That's what you're owed. That seems hard to dispense with, this idea, because it seems you know, I did this. I earned it. Well, what about ideas of fairness with regard to this idea? What's fair? Well, you're saying, well, I earned my grade. That's fair for you to give me the A. What are some other ideas of fairness? Treating everybody equally. Should I treat everybody equally? Obviously, if I'm giving you A's, B's, C's, D's, and F's, I'm not treating everybody equally, am I? Right. But that's, doesn't that seem unfair? You all paid the same amount of money for this class. Okay, but if I go to Dillard's and I buy a sweater, you could go and buy the same sweater and they're going to give you the same results, right? That's called equality of results rather than equality of effort. Is that fair? You all paid the exact same amount of money for this class. But we're paying for admission to the class, not for the grade, right? Right. So this idea of equality of results doesn't always, but why does equality of results work in some things? Why is it different at Dillard's than it is in this classroom? Why is it, you could buy the same, you could buy, if you went, I don't know where I got this t-shirt or this, this polo shirt for UCO, you're going to get exactly the same thing. Why is equality different in that sense than it is in this class? You're all paying the same. What's the, what's the, Huh? Dillard's doesn't have a sense of like effort or work or time that goes into it. The only time it took you is however long you live from Dillard's. Whereas here, you're going to have to spend hours like researching, studying, doing assignments, doing the work. Okay, so there's a qualitative difference. You get a duck and you get a, you get a duck. Um, there's a qualitative difference between the goods or services that are being marketed is what you're saying. There's a difference between a tangible product and an intangible product. Okay, I'll buy that. The way Socrates dispenses with this idea of equality of results, giving everybody their due, is through an, an, an allegory. Let's suppose you loan me a dangerous weapon, like a rifle. I grew up in a hunting family. Don't really like to hunt anymore. I still like to shoot, but I don't really, you know, I, I prefer to think, I, I try to be a vegetarian. It lasts for about four hours until I get hungry. If you've ever watched a movie called Food, Inc., you'll want to become a vegetarian. If you care about animals at all, the way we process mass pro mass production of food. And, and it goes on in the state. There are more pigs in Western Oklahoma than, than there are humans. And if you know anything about animals, again, philosophers will tell you that we're the only ones that are rational. We're the only ones that have feelings. That's just not true. Modern uh, neuroscience suggests that, that these creatures are sentient beings. And pigs, in particular, are enormously close to humans. That's why we use uh, pig insulin uh, for people who are diabetics. That was that was the first. I don't know if they still make insulin out of out of or from pigs, but you know it works for human beings. There's a um, a writer named Cy Montgomery who wrote a book about uh, Jolly the Jolly Pig that she had. Um, she saved this pig, piglet. It was the runt of the litter and how it became, you know, her, her friend. And it saved her from committing suicide, uh, this, this pig, and writing this book about it. And if you go out to Western Oklahoma, there are these corporate hog farms. 
So you, you, if you care about animals, you watch Food Inc. And you, you sort of want to become a vegetarian, maybe even a vegan, because you know the way they raise chickens for eggs is not necessarily great. Even if you buy, if you if you make yourself feel a little bit better by buying the range-free eggs, how many of you buy range-free or cage-free eggs? And you have this idea of the bucolic chicken out there pecking on the ground and, you know, laying eggs on the prairie. Uh, that's not the way it works, really, right? Like these, these chickens, they've never really seen outside. They open the door and they, they say they're range-free chickens, but they're really, you know, this idea of, of them, you know, living on the, the happy little farm, running around eating worms, that, that's not the way it really works. So, you know, I, I think about becoming a, a vegetarian and then it it, uh, it goes away very quickly when I become hungry. So let's suppose you say you've got this, this rifle that I should try out um, for hunting, although I don't hunt anymore. I'll go do target practice. I'll shoot sporting clays, things like that. And when I go to return the rifle to you, your eyes are spinning around in different directions and you've gotten a bad grade from Professor Kaiser down the hall. And you're talking about climbing the, the watchtower at Old North. And this happened at the University of Texas. The student climbed the clock tower and like started shooting people. Should I give you the gun back? You're all shaking your head. No, but it's yours. You bought it. You own it. It's your second amendment right to have the gun, that's giving you your due. Isn't it? Yeah, but you still, don't you have a second amendment right to have that gun? Yeah, but then you're taking away the other people's due by taking their lives. Well, I don't know that. That's a hypothetical, isn't it? <laughs> like I should just give you what's owed to you, which is the gun. Socrates, mm, no. No, that, no, that's not going to work, right? Is it? Should I give you the rifle back? No. The NRA says I should give you the rifle back. I, I mean, they're horrified by these ideas of, of the laws that can confiscate your guns if you have a psychological condition. Yeah, Socrates says no. So finally... People get sort of annoyed in Republic with Socrates constantly shooting down their ideas, this idea of giving everybody their due. And they finally say, you know, like, what, 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 what do you think, Socrates? What's your idea? And so he engages in an allegory. And this is one of the best worked out allegories in all of literature. And the first time I read it as an undergraduate, so I had to read Republic in a course called um, what was it? Political philosophy one. So we had two sections of political or two, two things. If you were a political science major that you had to take, you had to take ancient through modern and modern through postmodern or something like that in, in political science to get your degree. And, or maybe you only had to take one, but I took both. I ended up taking both. I think you had to take two, but anyway, so the first time I read this, so I'm having to read Republic and it was one of the few classes in undergraduate that I actually did have to read the book because there's just so much. We had like five or six books that we had to read. Um, we had to read Machiavelli's The Prince. That was you know, the start of modern through postmodern or whatever. Um, but ancient, so we had to read Republic. And the first time I read it, I'm thinking like, this is the stupidest thing I've ever read in my entire life, this allegory of the cave. So... You should read it. Um, Republic is, if, if you're going to read a great work of philosophy, it's easy to read because it's written like a play. It's dialogue form. Um, and this is the one of the best worked out allegories in all of, in all of uh, literature. But the first time I read it, you know, I'm a 20-year-old, 19-year-old, I guess, undergraduate. And I'm thinking, like, this is just completely stupid. This is like the stupidest thought experiment I've ever heard of in my, because it's completely unbelievable. So what is the allegory of the cave? 
Well, let's suppose you have a civilization that's raised in a cave. They're all <clears throat> positioned in such a way as that all they can see is what's in front of them. And I'm not much of an artist. I really wish I were better. My, my mother is a fantastic artist. So you've got this cave. So you enter the cave. Now there's various zones in the cave, right? So like from where the light can get to, um, that's one zone. And then where it starts to sort of darken out, that's actually called, I believe in, in geology, like the twilight zone where it becomes harder. And then there is the dark zone where there's no light. If you've ever been through a cave, um, Missouri, if, if you travel to Missouri, has lots of caves. They even have a cave where they ride you through the cave in a Jeep, which is kind of fun. So you, you go into the dark zone where, and they'll do this experiment at that cave. It's called Miracle Cavern, I think. They'll turn out all the lights and you get to experience what utter, I mean, usually we don't experience complete and utter darkness. Even in our rooms, when we turn off the lights at night, Usually you can see, unless you have blackout curtains, you can see the moon, there's some light, right? And it's kind of an eerie feeling to be in that dark zone where there is no light, absolutely not. So suppose you have these people that are positioned in such a way as all they can see is that wall in front of them and behind them is a, a fire and people carry things in front of the fire. So it is projecting shadows on this wall over here. What are these people who are raised in this cave going to believe is reality? Well, they're going to think that these images that they see on this wall are real. That's reality for them. And again, you know, as a 19-year-old who's reading this, I'm like, this is stupid. You can't raise people in a cave. Da, da, da. Turns out that lots of preachers do live in caves, and they, they exist. And they thrive. There are these fish that are completely blind that live in the cave, and these crawfish that are completely blind that live in the cave. And there are crickets that live in the cave that are they're colorless. They're really ugly. I got to see some this summer when I took my niece and nephew to the caves in, in Missouri. Something to do with these little kids. And you know, so you have these people, there's these others that are walking with pots and things and projecting these images. And what happens is these people in the cave start to, you know, I mean, your, your mind wanders. You start to to think about or predict what's going to happen next. And the, the people who get good at predicting maybe become the leaders of these other people in, in the cave. They become the wise men. But this is all an illusion. It's all fake. And again, people agree particularly philosophers, that this is like this, this great, and I was sitting there just, and it took me a long time to think about this. I really, I, I took the course, I got an A, and I didn't think much about it until I took other philosophy courses and I started thinking about this, this deeply. These people are deluded. What happens if one of them is forced free taken out, and they're forced to turn around and see the light. All of a the sudden, they're going to realize this, this fire that everything they thought before was an illusion. Now, let's suppose that even more than that, they're not just forced to face the fire. They're drugged to, you know, so this, this part is like the twilight zone, and this is the dark zone from here over, right? But there's a spire. If they're forced out of the cave, they're really going to understand that everything they thought before 
was fake and was not real. Well, what do we get from this? We don't get an answer as to what is ultimately justice. But what this works out to is that there are people among us who can understand reality, that see things enormously clearly. We are, we are consumed every day in a world of illusion. And we think we know what is real, but do we? Let's think about advertising, for example. You see all kinds of claims made in the marketing world to you about products and what they will do for you. And they offer miracle cures. It's one of the things that we as Americans are not good at. We are not good at delayed gratification, are we? It's one of the reasons that very few people go to college because this is hard. When I used to be a political scientist, so I didn't start out as a marketing professor. I started out as a professor in the political science department. And I used to have to teach this course called American National Government. And it was a horrible course to teach. I can't even fathom going back to that life because as a marketing professor, all I have to teach are 3,000, 4,000. We don't have any under or lower undergraduate lower level courses in marketing. They're all 3,000 and 4,000 level courses. So what does that mean? I'm teaching people who actually want to sort of know what it is that I'm talking about, particularly when I teach the professional selling because I'm one of the professional sales coaches. Like those students are really motivated to know what it is that I can teach them. And I, I have produced award-winning teams. You know, I, I, have, I have coached, uh, you know, like seven winners at national competitions, first place winners, first and second place winners at national competitions. One competition until COVID, we won five years in a row. And these people are really motivated to know, but I used to teach this course called American National Government. It's horrible, you all had to take it. You probably took it a long time ago. And students in there say things like, I just don't like government politics, it's boring. I don't wanna know anything. That, you know. So it was, it was really, really hard. And why is it that very few people get the college degree? Because it's hard. And it requires the retention of a lot of knowledge. And most people don't have the ability to go through the rigor to think about these things. And so we are deluded every day. They do. Absolutely. And there's no instant gratification to this. It's no longer a four-year degree. When I graduated, I graduated in four years. My mother thought I was a layabout because she had graduated in three well, that's easy to do when all you have to do is go to school. You know, her parents paid for it. That's all, that, her, that was her job, was to go to school. Most of you have to have a job now to pay for this. And so it's really hard to get this thing. And it really requires a lot of thought. And most people don't have that thought. And most people are living in this cave. We want instant gratification. And we see these advertisements on television that say, if you want to grow hair, take this pill. And it, it will miraculously appear. If you want to lose weight, take this pill. And we, we, we believe these claims. We're deluded in some instances in this. We're, we're delusional. And most people are delusional. They, they engage in what I call functional fictions. What are functional fictions? These are the things we tell ourselves to get through the day. To make it through the day. 
and we all do it. We all engage in these functional fictions. What are my functional fictions? Well, I tell myself that I come down here to uh, UCO and I teach students and I transform lives and I make a difference. I don't know if that's true. That's what I tell myself. That, you know, like maybe I'm not reaching a lot of students. You know, I broadcast this. Anybody can watch my YouTube channel. I hope that there are people out there. I have, you know, a whopping 200 and something odd subscribers to my YouTube channel. Not nearly enough to make a living at this. Apparently, I'm not as entertaining as the ghost people. So there are all these ghost channels out there that you can watch. This is a very popular thing. And lots of people do their ghost hunting. And, they, and uh, you know, they, they make money at this. I know several people who make $100,000 a year as YouTube stars. And there are people that make far more than that. These are not terribly entertaining videos. So, you know, but maybe I'm reaching somebody. That's my functional fiction. <coughs> Excuse me. That I come down here and I somehow make a difference. And that, you know, lets me sleep well at night. That I am providing a good service to students and, and maybe changing lives. Um, now, maybe there's some evidence for that functional fiction in that the students that I have coached have gone on to have very successful careers in sales. All of my students make far more money that have graduated, you know, and I make a good living doing this, but all of them make far more money than I do now. So there's some there's some evidence for my functional fiction, you know. I mean, but we all tell ourselves these things. We all delude ourselves into believing. The philosopher is somebody who can cut through that. I tell students everybody has a line. Don't believe your own line. Think about it. The philosopher is somebody who cuts through this. So what do we get from Republic? Well, what we get, if we take this idea, is that there are these people that can see through this, that can see the ultimate reality, that can know what it is to actually be a table. There's this ideal form of a table, and it exists as a perfected idea in the realm of the forms. And when it comes to these concepts like justice, there are these people who see so clearly that we should follow them. So what do we get from Republic? We get the foundation of a government that is a Republican form of government in Republic. What, for the ancients, beginning with Socrates, what is a Republic? A Republic is a government in which you have elements of these things. And one of those elements that you have is a monarchy. There's an element of monarchy, and you get this idea of the philosopher king. This is the person who can see things. The philosopher is the one who can see things clearly and can see justice. The rest of us are only seeing echoes of justice. But there is an absolute concept of justice, and these people can tell it. Now, you also get other classes in Republic, the guardians. This is the elite. So this is a, a element of aristocracy, and that's part of Republican government. So you have an element of monarchy, you have an element of aristocracy in the guardians, and then you have some elements of democracy, or polity, as they called it in the ancient world. That's what you get. That's why it's called Republic. Because what Socrates does is he says, well, look, you know, it's really hard to determine what justice is for the individual. But if we look at the aggregate, if we look at the larger unit, and societies are just individuals writ large, if we can determine what is just for that society, maybe we can determine what's just for the individual. And I'm out of time. So we'll pick up and we'll move into modern philosophy. Uh, next time, I will have ended with uh, the ancients. I'll, I'll finish with 
uh, Aristotle and um, Plato next time, and we'll move on to some modern ethical theory and uh, discuss that, and then we'll move into corporate social responsibility after that. If you got ducks today, come see me so that I can give you your points, and I'm going to end this right now so I can do that. Thank <laughs> you.